I posted uh, on the, on Canvas. There's a Pages tab, and if you go over to that, uh, it's just a place you I can you can post stuff that stays there rather than announcements that kind of you know scroll. You have to find dig stuff up. So there's a there's a page there for uh, class recordings. So I'm just gonna keep posting the links there. So that can be your, your one stop uh, if you want to go back and reference any uh, the uh, any of the courses that we've, uh, we've had so far. Awesome, and we'll just use the same recurring link, so you guys can just bookmark this link. Yeah, um, we'll use the same one every time. Okay, so we were uh, talking about a lot of great stuff last time. I wanted to kind of start with some links that I put on the announcement. So there was a request about some additional readings on this area of natural computing. And so I've put uh, three books on here. And uh, the PDFs, I've, I've loaded them up onto our GitHub directly, so you have the copies of the, of the... And there's three. The one I want to kind of start with first here is this book called Biomimicry. Right? And so now, these are more just like if you're looking for extra kind of stuff, right? Um, but I really encourage everybody to go through this, this Biomimicry book, you know, this weekend or whenever you get a few extra hours. Um, it's such a great book. I don't think it would take you that long to read it. Uh, Janie's really done an amazing job going out and interviewing the, some of the top researchers in the world in a lot of these different areas. And just to kind of show you the breakdown here, um, you know, it's about biomimicry. So it's, you know, how do we learn from nature? And she has these nice, uh, you know, chapter titles. How will we feed ourselves? How will we harness energy? How will we make things? How will we heal ourselves? How will we store what we learn? How will we conduct business? And so she goes through and she, you know, she talks about uh, protein chemistry and, 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 and all kinds of amazing, you know, cutting edge science, material science. It's, it's a truly fascinating book. And she does a really great job explaining this in a nice, easy read, but you really will learn a lot. Um, I strongly recommend this book. But again, it's only, it's sort of just extra. And then we've got two other books. Uh, one here is called The Computational Beauty of Nature uh, by Gary Flake. This is a really great book. It's a lot, a lot more detail. So don't be intimidated by this one as you flip through it. This one definitely goes into the nuts and bolts at certain times, but it's a really great book. Um, this is really a beautiful quote right here about, you know, why, why scientists do things. And it's really about, uh, it's about beauty. And it's about, you know, figuring out, the, 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 as Feynman said, the joy of figuring things out. So this is a really beautiful textbook, but there is kind of a lot of detail in this one. So this one's a little bit more uh, technical, but it's sort of, certainly worth flipping through. Um, some of the stuff we covered in the last semester's course in nonlinear dynamics, we won't necessarily have time to cover that in this course. Um, and then there was one more here. This is the computing universe by Tony Hay. And this is, this really is a fantastic sort of general textbook. And so if you're new to computing in general, and if maybe computers to you mean email and stuff like that, jump into this book because this is really extraordinary. This has a lot of the history that we're kind of touching upon. Um, Tony Hay is the head of, um, Microsoft Research, and he wrote the uh, the book Computation. Uh, the, Feynman wrote a series of lectures, and Tony Hay was the editor of that, which is a fantastic book. So that's why I'm a big fan of uh, of him. Um, but you can see they've got some really question. Uh, uh, can you share your screen, please? Oh, I'm so sorry. I wish you had said sooner. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Let me just kind of back up real quick. Um, Okay, so I was I was looking at on the announcements. Thank you for letting me know. Um, please don't be afraid to jump in and let me know if I'm if I'm acting like an idiot here in these times. So okay, so we've got these announcements, and uh, I put three links on here. The first one is this Janie Virus. Uh, I was saying, so this is just a really great. Um, it's a really great book. It reads like a book. It's it's got a lot of technical content, but it but it's very well written. So you can just kind of sit down and read it. It's really fascinating. And I was just kind of showing the um, the table of contents about. You know, how will we compute like a cell and how we weave fibers like a spider and talks about the abalone shell is incredible and how it forms in seawater. Uh, so that's, that's a fantastic text. And then let me pull up the others here. I hate this little bar in the window. How do I get that thing out of the way? Exactly where I don't want that. Let's see if I can hide that. Anybody know how I can hide this little toolbar panel? And there's one way of doing it. Okay, at least that's a little bit more out of the way. Okay, so we had a couple other books here that I wanted you to have a chance to take a look at. This one is uh, called Computational, The Beauty of Nature. 
And um, this one's got, it's a little more technical, as I was saying. So this one's kind of technical, but jump into it, flip through it. It's, it's a really great textbook. It's got fractals and a lot of great stuff that we'll kind of just breeze over in this class. And then this other one I was saying is Tony Hay. Oops, wrong, wrong link. Uh, this one, The Computing Universe. And this is a really sort of thorough uh, book. It's got a lot of great stuff in it. I would encourage everybody to flip through this one for sure. It's got a lot of great stuff on, on Babbage and von Neumann and Turing and, you know, all these kind of characters that we're going to be talking a lot about. Uh, so go through this for sure. Uh, you know, we, I wish we had time to go through, to go through all of this in this course, but there's kind of too much to cover, unfortunately, but definitely flip through this. And if there's anything you pull out that you want to talk about explicitly, we'll go through it. Um, I'll pull out some sections as we get to some of these things. It's got some great stuff here on the Turing machine, as you can see. Um, so just flip through that. That one's got some really great stuff. It's got some stuff about AI at the end and some nano stuff. And so that's just a really great sort of classic textbook on computing. Okay, so that was the, the request for more materials on natural computing or sort of general or computer science for the natural sciences, as you could say. Okay, so I put those there. I've also put on here this protocells link. So last time we were looking at these fascinating cells, these, these protocells. Um, I've put in a few links here. This one's the TED Talk. It's really fantastic. It's about the boundary between life and non-life. And um, there's certain things in the world that we don't quite know where to put them. And then I found that the, I found a couple more of these videos that we were looking at to show this sort of fluidic style computing. You know, what, what, is, the, what is the point of showing this? It's that is that there's these objects in the natural world that are right in front of us that have been essentially ignored by mainstream mathematics and even mainstream science. And it was largely because we were busy. People were figuring out some other stuff. But uh, I was hinting last time, you know, one of my favorite ideas is sort of how pessimistic people were about science around 120, 130 years ago. The, in, in the 1890s, the patent office very famously said, we should probably just close because everything had already been invented. Um, you know, Ernst Mach, you know, a very famous scientist, you know, in the 1890s stood up in the back of the room at one point and said, I don't believe in atoms, right? And so we had this, you know, and this, there's another idea that said that, that physics is now in the decimal places. In the 1890s, they felt that way. And what that meant was everything was discovered. You could maybe get a slightly better measurement. You can be a little more careful with your rulers, but there was nothing fundamentally new to understand or discover. And I think, you know, couldn't be farther from the truth. I think science is this, this sort of illusion that, yeah, we know all this stuff. And it's like, no, we don't. We haven't even really gotten started. It's the, uh, the searching under the spotlight. So, for example, these types of, of, of fluid behaviors, this is not well defined or it's not well described by any classical theory. If you were to go and you study, you know, undergraduate physics and you get a physics textbook or you go to a big bulky chemistry textbook, these are not going to be in there. These are very modern experiments. Uh, but I like how simple they are. You can do these at home, right? They're showing you right here how you can do this with food coloring and you, and you get a little piece of glass and you, and you heat it up to just, you know, sort of clean off the glass and then you can dilute these little drops and put them on there and you can run this experiment yourself. So the idea that, you, that we can discover new physics for $10 is like extraordinary to me. So that's why I'm, I'm really excited about that fluidic stuff. I think it's going to have tremendous importance for understanding um, modern biology. How are we going to understand something like cancer dynamics if we don't know how just water, colored water dances around? Right. I mean, think about the implications of that. Like, that we're missing something about how food coloring moves around on, outside of any other external influence, right? It's not a biological system. It's pretty extraordinary. Okay, so this one I put some, some analog computings. You know, we're looking at this whole theme of complex systems, which is related to natural computing. I think one of the unifying themes is the, is the math of the last hundred years that was so important or so valuable or so dangerous that it was not really made public. And then also the assignment, these things are victims of their own success. And so they work so well, that you're just not going to tell anyone about it. Um, so we looked at this old Navy documentary about mechanical computing. So if you haven't seen this one, definitely go through and, and watch this it talks about differentials and all kinds of really fascinating ways. Um, maybe your brain has never thought this way, or, or maybe it's good at thinking this way. You know, how do we turn math into machinery and get the machinery? I mean, I just think that's, that's crazy when you think about it, right? We know what math is, the stuff we learned in grade school. The idea that I can take pieces of metal and cut them in the right shape and put them in the right arrangement and turn a crank and that thing does mathematics, that's a really wacky idea, right? We're going to, you know, we're going to talk about some fancy AI in this class, 
In the 1600s, counting was AI. Being able to multiply or divide numbers was essentially artificial intelligence. It was extraordinary, um, extraordinarily difficult. Look, here's like another one just popped up here about gun control computers that we were looking at last time. I don't know if I've seen this one. So definitely go out, um, go out and see if you can find bonus points, if you can send me some really cool films I haven't seen. No, I'm just kidding. No, really send them. Um, and so this one, if you haven't seen the, uh, the mechanical computing, definitely watch this one. It's really extraordinary. It'll change the way you think about math. I think we sort of all overfit about what mathematics is, essentially. Okay, so here's a really good one. This is uh, one of the, um, the world leading researchers in, in analog computing right now. Um, I, I guess, I don't know, how would you say his name? Uh, Bernd? Bernd? So he's this, this a German fellow, a really nice guy, um, and he studies this, uh, this analog computing. So he's got a great set of, of, of lectures here that you can go through and watch that one if you haven't seen it. Uh, he's definitely one of the world's experts in that. And then there's another documentary or it's sort of a, a set of audio and slides. This is a really cool kind of format, late 60s, early 70s kind of format, where it was a, a slideshow with like a record player, you know, like Matt, and then they synchronized it and they put them online. So it's like a... It's, yeah, yeah. I think they took, they took out the beeps, thankfully, for us. But this is actually a very good little, I'll call it a film, um, about analog computing. These things are very, very rare, right? You can see this was just posted October 2020. It's like, I love it. We can get more of the past, but I'm frustrated that there's that this is not part of our current, you know, um, culture because it's so important. So this is a 1960s set of slides about a magnetic tape here. It's really cool um, about analog computers. So please definitely go through that one. It's very it's very high level. Um, you will definitely learn. You will learn some stuff about that. All right. So part of this course is to kind of expose you to these ideas. You know, we certainly won't have enough real time to, to go through them all. I just want to make sure that you guys are aware of these. These are the most powerful and important ideas that I've encountered in my career. And I want to make sure that you guys encounter them as early as you can. Okay, so this is a fantastic documentary. I know it seems like a lot, but these are like 20 minutes. You guys have a lot of time in the world, right? When you go to put up Netflix or Amazon Prime or whatever, watch one of these instead and then go watch the show you watch. I watch these on double time. So I like to go and I watch these on, on, on double time, but if you're not used to that, you can speed it up by, by a little bit. I've, anytime I watch a video, I've seen it probably five times or, or more. If I assign a video, I usually watch it twice right then and there to make sure it's not unreasonable. I won't, I won't assign you to watch a video that I'm not willing to watch twice in a row. I like to I joke with some students, if you remember when you were a little kid and you might have a favorite show, uh, uh, some movie, some cartoon you liked, The Lion King or something like this, and you were a little kid, you might remember when it was over, what did you do? You rewound it and you watched it again. This is what kids do. And so kids are honest with themselves and they know their brain did not capture all of that information. As adults, we think, oh, I saw that show. It'll be boring if I watch it again. You have to fight that instinct and rewatch these lectures more than once so that you can actually, like a little kid, truly absorb all the content. This one is fascinating. This is one of the best I've seen. I put this on my own channel just because I was make sure it didn't get taken off the internet. Um, and this is about the famous story of oscillating chemical reactions. So we're going to look at these today. Um, we're going to simulate these with partial differential equations. And here we looked at this previously with our forest fire model. So definitely go through and, and watch this. It's an extraordinary story of uh, this experiment where they had you mix two chemicals and normally we'd expect the, the chemicals to mix and maybe change colors. And what they found is it certainly sudden spontaneously unmixed and changed back in color. And then like a spring, it went forward and backwards and forward and backwards. And this reaction went forward and, and undid itself over and over again. When they submitted this report to the, uh, the Soviet National Academy of Science, they rejected the paper. And they said, such things do not happen in nature. You must have done something wrong with your experiment. And it wasn't that the, uh, the experiment was wrong, it's that our understanding of science itself was wrong. Our understanding of mathematics was wrong. We did not quite have the right mathematical tools to describe things like chemical systems. So this is a fantastic documentary. Definitely go through and, and watch this one, and then we'll discuss more after you've, uh, you've seen that one. So again, that's 20 minutes. If you watch it on double time, it takes 10 minutes. What I would do, I would watch it twice on double time. But that's just me. Okay, so I put a lot on here, so I just wanted to go through these. I think this is the last one here. I put one more that I was reminded of, and this is a great doc. This is a great uh, paper, very, very sort of foundational in this whole meta field. And it's er Erwin Schrödinger was the, the the guy who invented, uh, largely responsible for the formulation of quantum mechanics, um, is, is, is the most popular form in a sense. This famous Schrödinger's equation. You've heard of his cat. 
he wrote this um he wrote this paper called what is life and if you look this was uh, decades before dna was actually discovered but he very famously proposes that there was an aperiodic crystal he said there must be something like a crystal inside of the living organism that has a pattern but the pattern is aperiodic and periodic just means it goes as a regular pattern but that's boring. You're not learning anything. If you know it's going to go dump, 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 dump. Well, there's no information in that. So we need some kind of pattern, like, a, like music, right? Where there's regularity, but there's also information in that. And so this is a fantastic, um, you know, kind of look at physics or at life from the point of view of physics. He gives some really good arguments of why we are gigantic. So we talked about last time about how enormous we are and how we're made out of these tremendous large numbers of pieces. I wanted to show the David Goodsell stuff in a second to kind of uh, show that. But he gives some really cool arguments about why we have to be so large. And it's about these, it's related to this random walk. It's related to this statistical probabilities that, well, we're made out of atoms. And if I lose one, I'm losing tons of them right now. And thankfully, I'm large enough that that doesn't really matter. I think this sort of the size of people, I think, is a really interesting thing. We talked briefly about this idea of membrane computing um, and about, you know, how do we use space itself to compute? So I think that's some really interesting stuff. Okay, so I know that's a sort of a whole laundry list. You don't stress about it. You know, you've, you've got your rest of your life to, to, to read this stuff. You know, everyone thinks like, well, I'm supposed to figure this all out. Like, am I going to have to figure this out by the midterms or whatever? It's like, no, I'm just trying to change your life, right? You're going to have to figure out how you're going to inject this in the semester. I'll give you stuff to do so you can have some feedback about if you're, if you're learning this material. But obviously, I'm going to, I'm going to essentially giving you already more material than, you could, than we could have time for. But you have a whole graduate career. You have the whole rest of your life. And I would encourage you to look into these ideas. Uh, as I mentioned last time, this natural computing, if we pull up, right, so I sort of call these, these sort of the, the misfits here, right? And so we have artificial neural networks, evolutionary algorithms, swarm intelligence, artificial immune systems, fractal geometry, artificial life, DNA computing, quantum computing. A lot of people I meet think I'm sort of nuts because I'd like to study all of these things and they just understand this is my field. This is, this is what I study. Um, my point being is that everybody laughed at these subjects. I don't want to say laughed at them. I, they were, there were scientists who took these things very serious and there was journals and papers and all kinds of great stuff, but they didn't have a lot of sort of global attention. And as I was <laughs> mentioning last time, in the last 10 years, artificial neural networks essentially won the lottery. I think I can safely say this is the, one of the most valuable technologies on the planet. Um, it's heavily pursued by every major government and every major uh, industry on the planet. Uh, I don't think of any major tech company that's not heavily, heavily investing in this space. It's going to determine the difference between, you know, which companies make it, which companies don't. Um, I, we found a list at one point, we we're showing the list of companies that use artificial intelligence. And this is kind of like a joke. This is like saying companies that have a website or companies that use electricity. Right. Every company will either use artificial intelligence or they will go out of business. There's not going to be any middle ground. And we're already very quickly in that in that territory. So my suggestion is, is that these others are just as important, are just as important. And why why were all of these unknown? Well, they were sort of classified. Right. These are literally the things that that DARPA and the military study because they're so important. Right. So got quantum computers. Right. That's, a, that's pretty obvious. Uh, artificial life. These things, this is kind of what, this is some pretty heavy stuff that, that, uh, that DARPA works on that we can, we can look at later. So hey, I think that, yeah, question. Yes, um, in, in your opinion, so about scientists missing the mark, I, I remember um, years ago when Wolfram did his new kind of uh, science book. Yeah. And um, I, I, was, I was excited because everyone else was excited about it. But then <laughs> it seemed like it, it was, um, it wasn't what everyone expected to be more so, I guess, because it tailored toward a certain group of people. Um, and Wolfram will be the right guy to do, to try to invent something new, you know, being his personality. But um, this class actually made me go look back at that book. And because every time I've looked at it, I've always just looked at the notes in the back. I never really, <laughs> I didn't look at the meat. I just kind of like, oh, okay, so this means this, and this is what Wolfram kind of thinks about it or what it means. But now, since this class, I've actually looked at his book, and I didn't realize that he he what he is actually trying to make this link between um, physics and this and the complexity um, of of the computation. And in your opinion, I, I don't think. I mean, do you think anyone took him 
took him serious or yeah, it's a great was, question I'm, I'm really glad you, glad, glad you brought that up because I, I i was meaning to show these slides was about that so we can kind of jump into that i think it's a great point so if those are not aware the uh, stephen wolfram um a very interesting character and he's sort of a brilliant scientist but I, I like to joke he gets no points for modesty and um you know so he, he might be a brilliant scientist but he it's, it's hard a lot of people are kind of like bah, i don't want to because he you know it's a bold claim to say you have a new science right and he wrote this book, he said, I have a new kind of science, right? And so, and essentially it was a very sort of aggressive uh, move with sort of the rest of the scientific community. And I think because of that, people largely ignored his result. And I think that was unfortunate because as arrogant or e egotistical as he might be, he, he's onto something. And I don't think he deserves all the credit. I think most of the credit needs to go to von Neumann. Um, but, but nonetheless, he really did, a, I think, a tremendous work in this sort of a very different kind of science. It's almost like this Victorian, you know, uh, collection of, of um, leaves and flowers and stuff. You know, they used to go out and that's what science was, you know, a few hundred years ago. They would just like kind of press all these flowers into a book. And that's kind of what, uh, what, what Wolfram did. So um, everybody's familiar with Wolfram Alpha. So this guy built this software. So he's got a lot of money and, and he was able to kind of self-publish this. And when the rest of the science community didn't know what he was talking about, he said, well, I don't care. I'll just publish it myself in my own book. And so he did. And so he called this a new kind of science. And so it's a great opportunity. Uh, thank you. So we'll kind of jump into that because it's the cellular automata stuff we've been talking about. And I think what you're saying is like, you know, did people take him serious enough? And I don't think so. I think there's this idea of digital physics that uh, I think is a really big deal. And I don't think we've quite emerged yet into the point where the rest of physics takes it serious in a sense. Um, when, you, when you create a new branch of something, right? Like I think the, the gasoline engines and the electrical engines are sort of a good analogy for stuff because the electric engine we had at first, and then we came up with the gasoline engine and that got better and better and better. And it took a long time for the sort of this electrical idea to actually get better than the gasoline engine and sort of that now that's happening. And I think that's kind of how it is. Like regular classical physics is pretty good. It's well developed. It's been developed for a few hundred years. And now we have things like quantum and special relativity and all that. And so physicists haven't really needed the cellular automata yet. But I think as we get into more and more interesting areas and sort of especially in these biological systems. So let me jump in here. I, uh, some slides I put together a while back because I was actually really fascinated by this Wolfram book when it first came out. Um, so let me just kind of jump into this and then maybe see if this can answer some of those questions. Um, it's really about, you know, what is the shape of nature itself? We have, you know, the Greeks put together these classic shapes for us, the, 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 the simple, simple shapes and polygons and stuff. And for a long time, we kind of just built science out of that. But it might have even held things back, right? Astronomers for hundreds of years said, no, the orbits are circles. And we'll fudge the numbers if we have to, but we're pretty sure these things go in nice, perfect circles. And it was sort of relaxing that geometry. Said, well, you know, it, you know, ovals aren't ugly; they're okay. We can use ovals, and maybe the uh, the orbits go in ovals. And that was a much better sort of geometrical model. So I like this idea of the information is physical. We have information theory, but you know, this was developed by the uh, telephone company. Uh, the the person who invented it wanted to call it communication theory, Claude Shannon. And so I think we kind of. It's still missing a lot of things about what we what we intuitively mean by information, right? Hopefully, there's some information in this lecture, and that's very different than what what Shannon talked about. Um, this idea of continuous behavior, I think, is really at the heart of a lot of stuff. This this is the analog versus digital kind of thing. Um, this idea of simple programs. So we're going to show some of the automata. We're going to look at one dimensional automata today, which is kind of cool. And then these patterns in nature, and then these couple ideas about computation. We'll get to. So um, I really like this guy. Uh, I forgot to put his middle initial. He has a middle initial of Benoit B. Mandelbrot. And his joke, because he invented fractals, and the, and the middle initial is B. Benoit Mandelbrot. So it sort of goes in a, in a circle, right? Um, but his middle initial stands for his full name, and that's the joke, because he invented fractals. And so he had this, this quote about the things we see in nature. They're not straight lines. They're not you know cones and spheres and all this stuff. So something we're missing something terrible. So we either ignore, we just sort of go, no, 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 nature is made out of triangles, no big deal. Or we're, we're honest with ourselves and say, no, there's actually not really any squares or triangles or circles in nature to speak of. It's this other thing. What, what are they? Um, and I think this is related to, you know, this idea of like, how does nature store patterns? Like how do these patterns come about? And, and, you know, is it information itself that we're seeing in these patterns? But this idea that information is a branch of physics is really what this is about. That if we have a bit, it has to be in a clay tablet. It has to be, you know, in a number two pencil scribbled on a piece of paper. It has to be a bit sitting on a, on a register in a computer. It has to live somewhere, even if it's just in your head. And so this is what you were saying about, you know, what, what, was, what was Wolfram really talking about? And what he was talking about is this 
what this guy Ed Fredkin proposed. And he kind of came up with this digital physics. And, you know, there's a fundamental question about sort of the nature of reality and that if we zoom in on things, we take space itself or time or whatever, sort of anything, and we start zooming in on it and zooming in on it. How much can we zoom in on it? Do we sort of hit the graph paper of the world? Is the world made out of little Legos? Or is it like water, where it's just, there's more of it and you can divide it into little, little smaller and smaller drops? Well, we know water is made out of atoms and stuff. So these, I think these are really big open questions about the nature of space-time itself. And these are kind of wacky stuff. So if this doesn't make any sense or you haven't thought about this before, don't stress. Um, we're going to see what this looks like a little bit. And so these kind of models, they're, they're not approximations. So when we, classical physics, like I was mentioning last time, it doesn't actually solve the problem it says it's going to. It solves a slightly problem right next to it. And it hopes that that's good enough. And by and large, it does. And uh, we can do very sophisticated things with those approximations. These digital algorithms, these cellular automata, there's no ambiguity in what happens at the next step. They're, they're discrete. They're, there's, the, there's no probability. There's no coins in, our, in our, our code or anything like that. We're not using random numbers. But we're going to see it actually generates a lot of really interesting, look, random looking things. But these things are very interesting because they're sort of exact models. All right, so one of the things you can do with this is you can take these random walk models and sort of like, how would you get something that looks smooth? Like if I take this water, it doesn't seem like it's made out of chunks. It seems like it's like a, a fluid thing. So where do we move between Legos and, and, and the smooth reality? And so we can use these random walks that we initially looked at. And what's really neat here is if we do a random walk on graph paper, right? So we're only in ever like these discrete grid-like spots. But if we average many, many trials, and we have lots and lots of these agents, and each little agent is doing its own random walk, and then we look at thousands of them over time, we actually see a smoothing out. And so this is kind of like atoms are chunky, and they're only exist in certain finite uh, energy and momentum states and all this. But when we look at the classical universe, we see like a whole, a whole smooth continuum. And so what's interesting, it doesn't matter the type of random walk. So these are four different random walk uh, recipes and they all sort of emerge back to sort of famous normal curve, you know, why that shows up over and over again. Okay, so now I wanna show some simple programs. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll tab back and forth between Colab. Let me pull this up in Colab so we can see what this looks like in code. Let's pull up. Um... Let's go to our GitHub. I think I have it on there. I'm gonna pull up the complex systems GitHub and then give me just a second to see if this one's on there. Might not have put this one on there yet. What did I call that one? We're going to look at that one in a second, but where? Bear with me just one second while I pull up this, uh, try to find this other one. I have the one dimensional version. Okay, here it is. Yeah, okay, good. I found it. Okay, so we're gonna um, we're gonna look at these one dimensional. I want to be able to kind of go back and forth to that one. So we're gonna look at a, a different version of the cellular automata, and that it's only gonna live as a one dimensional world. So we're only gonna have one neighbor. So we're gonna live as a square. We're going to be on or off. We're going to iterate the next time step, and we want to decide if I'm if I'm a, a, a what's what square what square I'm gonna be on the next step. And so we make time go down. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna show each time step, the history is the previous row. And so we're gonna start this thing as just one uh, spot there. And then we're gonna let it go into the next time step. It's gonna grow one out to the left and right. We're gonna place that underneath the first line so that we see it going like that. And then when, now when we run the program, we're seeing the evolution of this one row at each time step going down the program. And so, the way these programs work is a very simple one-dimensional automata. And because of that, we can look at sort of the rules in a really cool way. 
because we only have three neighbors, right? So remember that in the first row, it's just a row. So your neighbors are only ever in your row. So let's pretend like we are this square here and we have a neighbor there and a neighbor there. So we find this pattern. Okay, so that pattern is right here. So we've got that pattern right there. And the way this works is the square below it says what, what you turn into. So you, you, you look up what you are plus your two neighbors, and then this will tell you what you become on the next step. Right? And so if we run that rule, that's going to build this out and actually determine what the next square is going to be. So what we can do is we can set a pattern here. These are always going to be fixed because there's the only a fixed combination. You can either be all empty, you can be all full, the first two, the, the last Could two. Can you show it on the screen instead of... Oh, yeah. Th thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so we can either see they can be all empty, they can be all full, the, the first two can be full, the last two can be full, the outer two, and so on. So these are the only possible patterns of on and off for three things. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of these. And then below this part here, which this thing wasn't in the way, hang on, let's see. Okay, so these, these down here, we get to decide. So the squares on the bottom, we get to decide, and that'll determine sort of the recipe that we're looking at. So this recipe says, no matter what they are, the only one that, that should be empty is if they're always, if they're empty before all three. Otherwise, it turn into something. And so depending on how, now this is a slightly different pattern. So we can see this pattern. Now we can read this like a binary number. We can think of this as like one, zero, 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 zero. So this would be the first pattern. Now we can do another pattern. We make that one a one, this one a zero, but that one a one. So the only time that this thing will become a white square is if all three were, or if uh, the two neighbors were. And so then that way, this will get that pattern. And so we can then change out. Now notice that these, the top row with the three in it, they always stay the same. That's not changing on us. But this bottom pattern is changing. So if we change this out and we do one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, we get this pattern. So this is called the Sierpinski gasket. And this is a sort of a fractal. And the first thing you want to think is, well, was that triangle recipe in there? Like, this almost seems too simple of a rule, right? It's like, imagine like you have a recipe and it says, take one cup of flour, stir it, and now you have a cake. It's like, that's not how flour works. You have, you have to, don't you have to add more stuff to get a cake? You know, this seems rather fancy compared to, compared to that. And so this has this sort of self-similarity. So we have a fractal. This is like what Ben Raw Mandelbrot looked at. But now the, one of the most interesting rules here, now you can count these, right? So these are binary numbers. Let me just go back. So we can translate this into a binary number. So we can think of this as maybe rule one, right? And this would be, um, so if it's rule like that, and then so we can have rule 90. So if we take this number and we convert it to binary, this is gonna be 90. If we take this number, convert it to binary, it'll be 30. And this rule, again, they're all the same. It's just this particular pattern of what to do based on what the neighbors are. Now this one's particularly interesting because it sort of has this sort of natural quality to it. I think it looks sort of like rain falling down a, a window or something like that is sort of what it reminds me of. It has this sort of natural organic -y looking feel to it. And what's, what's really fascinating is this recipe is, is determined. It's what's called deterministic. There's no chancy, there's no dicey, it's, there's no ambiguity. If you know what your three neighbors are, your two neighbors and yourself, you know exactly what you're going to be. But if we know this thing started at one center pixel, and I'm gonna run it for some amount of steps, to be able to guess what the color of the pixel in the center, or right down the center column is gonna be after some time, is called computationally irreducible. The only way to figure out what that square is going to be after 100 or so steps is to just run this thing. There's no shortcutting. There's no, there's no compression algorithm that you can guess. There's no, there's no, there's no pattern. There's no pattern here such that you could say, yeah, but after 72 things, it's going to go back to one of these again and start over. There has never been a pattern in this. This makes a very good random number generator. You can use this to generate random, random binary bits. And there's no shortcutting this process. And so uh, Wolfram, I think one of the most important ideas that Wolfram came up with is this idea of computational irreducibility. The idea that there's certain processes in nature that cannot be shortcut. There is no shortcut in the system that is cheaper than running the system itself. You could make some scheme to do it, but it will be much, much, much more expensive computationally than just running this thing. 
This thing is very simple to run. You just like a very modern computer just crank this thing out. So there's no shortcutting it. There's no shortcutting this procedure. Okay, so why is this interesting? Well, okay, quick question. Yeah. Is that actually like mathematically proven? Is there sort of like the like the halting problem? Is that known to be that that these uh, given a rule set and uh you know tell me how many you know I guess take a, an input as you know here's the rules and here's how many steps and you tell me what's in this square. Right? It's a great question. I don't think I don't think as far as I know I don't think there's a formal proof of it. There but is a formal proof. It was created it? several years later. I want, okay. I want to say it was in the '90s actually, but there is now a formal proof that rule thirty is that it's that it's computation irreducible. Pretty sure there is. Because I know that I, I know there's a proof. Yeah. We're, we're going to get to in a second that rule one ten is a Turing machine, and I know there's a rule of proof of that. I do know that Wolfram has said, you know, because he wrote this. That he wrote one of the most powerful mathematical programs on the planet. His his company, Wolfram Alpha, uh, Wolfram Mathematica. So uh, he ran every statistical analysis program that they could throw at this, and they've and they've run all the you know that kind of. So at least from a empirical engineering kind of side of things, they've tried to find patterns in this, and they can't. Yeah, um, but yeah, that's a it's a great question. So maybe there maybe there is a proof. That'd be fascinating if there is. I'd love to find it. Let us know, Beach, if you could find that. Um, I like this is interesting because I'm I'm trying to model nature. I care about nature, and um, North Carolina used to like to collect uh, these olive shells, and they have these very particular these very interesting patterns. And if you take a look at this one, this kind of looks like those triangles inside triangles. And the way this works is this these these seashells actually work as a cellular automata. They're a one dimensional cellular automata. This is actually described in the Janie Byers book. And she talks about the uh, material science and how strong these are. But the way these, these mollusks grow is they secrete the protein matrix along the outside. They're, they're a living thing. And so they, they, they put out an organic protein matrix. And those proteins are evolved in such a way that they actually pull the minerals out of the seawater and sort of molecularly assemble these things like a 3D printer, one molecule at a time. It's extraordinary, right? Engineering can't touch this stuff yet. Uh, and but, but the way that happens is because you have sort of one cell at this growing edge, it really is like a one dimensional automaton, right? You have one line of cells as this sort of the, 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 the leading edge of this thing uh, unfolds. And so you get these patterns where each cell is looking and running a dynamical system on, based on what its neighbors are, and you get this emergent pattern. And so what's really neat about this is you think, well, how did the DNA in an evolutionary sense encode for all of this complexity in these patterns? Well, all it has to do is encode for these eight bits. And so if you encode these eight bits and you have a cellular mechanism that looks at your neighbors, then you can get all of this vast variety of patterns simply by manipulating those eight bits, which is a very low dimensional space compared to your DNA. Well, so, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a, but wouldn't, I mean, that would be a perfect way to, an, an easy way to create, you know, a, a pattern based off of your environment where, you know, whatever is in that, in that, in that area and you pull those proteins or whatever out and can implement this rule 30, you know, you, you pretty much figured out how to adapt in the situation. And I think that would be this, as simplicity as that a rule is, it would be if I would run, if I would write a program <laughs> or an object um, um, it, to be survival you know, for survivability, that would that rule would be the perfect feature to add for adapting to, you know, its surroundings. And I, right. I because, it, yeah, because it's almost like a Swiss Army knife, too, because say you needed you know, it's not quite like an octopus where it can do it in real time, but say like the, 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 the situation changes in the coral landscape or wherever these things live in the, in the shore, in the, in the surf, um, you know, a volcano goes up and suddenly there's more, you know, volcanic ash or the color distribution changes. Well, now in the evolutionary sense, the DNA can just tweak a couple of those bits that determine the cellular automata rule. And now it can quickly go from, you know, from this one to this one in just a generation or so. So what's really neat about these, so since we have eight different, these things can be on or off. And so uh, we have uh, two different values for each possible spot and we have eight spots. And so we get two to the eighth. And so we have 256 different possible rules. And so what Rule from, what Rule from did that was really interesting. And he said, well, you know, the eighties, the computers were fast enough. He's at that point, he said, let's just loop it and try them all. He said, let's try every single one of them. And so this is rule one, rule two, rule three, rule four, and so on. And, uh, and you can see kind of the patterns that you get, that you get out of those. Um, here we can think of the, the seashell. I, I love this. So this is the seashell again. If we tweak these kind of these rules, so here's sort of an automata, but sort of a graph automata, and it's going to do the same thing. It's going to sort of decide what the next edge is going to be. So I, I really love those shapes. Um, 
you know, it's amazing how much, you know, science changes and how much, you know, people didn't know about these things. I remember as a, as a kid talking to my mom about the seashells and she thought they were just there. They'd, just, they'd always been there like rocks or something. Right. And I think it's fascinating that we now have the ability to think, well, no, how were they actually created? Right. We, we now have a science that's rich enough to think, OK, we know what atoms are. We know what cells are. How, where do seashells actually come from? Right? And they look striking like actual seashells. So I like, you know, sort of this mathematical model. These are augers. You can find these and you've got these, uh, these lady slippers and stuff like that. You can find these. Um, you can do the same thing with like a, like a, um, a ram, you know, like a goat or something like that that we have this, this automata that's sort of going out and it's building like sort of one notch at a time. But if we just add a slight bias and we make one side grow a little bit faster than the other, then we get sort of that effect. Uh, this is what, what, what uh, Turing set out to do. So this is what we're going to look at a little bit later with our partial differential equations. This was um, very sophisticated comp like continuous mathematics to, to figure out these patterns that, that Turing came up with. And now I think I've, I've put together a really dramatically simple way to do this it's like the cellular automata. And so we're going to see that it's really straightforward now to get these really kind of cool patterns. And just like the other automata, we get sort of a lower dimensional, like the control knobs, right? Imagine you're doing like a, um, a character creator in like a video game or something. You have a slider and that slider could change the hair color or, you know, something about this character, put a hat on him or something. And <clears throat> you just have this, these, these few little buttons you can press and it gives you a, a huge variety of possible forms. And I think that's what these, these systems are really enabling us to do. You know, when we look at this, it, it's striking as we can see the coat and the, the spots of the pattern. Think, well, that's where the, the lion got its spots. But this is also where it gets its fingers and toes, right? The actual shapes themselves, right? How, do, how does your toes figure out to, you know, to be a, a piggy toe versus a big toe? It's exactly the same mechanisms that it's the type deciding if it should be a stripe or a, a not stripe. And so we'll start these, these models out random and we'll see they sort of evolve into... into these sort of uh, these stripes. Um, we can do these same kind of models with leaves. So there's these things called um, Lindenmeyer systems, and these are L substitution systems. And what's really neat is if we just take this little recipe and it says wherever you find um, a vertical line, replace it with a vertical line plus two branches at that angle. So you can see they have slightly different recipes. This one says wherever you see a vertical line, replace it with these four little lines plus one coming down. And if we run that rule, oh, we get parsley. Right. If we run this rule, we get a Christmas tree. If we run that one, we get a maple leaf. Right. And so, again, once again, we have this very low dimensional space that evolution can search through and get an extraordinary wide variety of, of different um, phenotypes. And some of these things look really good. If you, play, if you run a modern video game, you know, they'll, they'll use these systems now to actually generate these trees. And so, you know, again, it's, I think it's, it's wild. But if we go back to, you know, the greatest mathematicians of, of, of ancient times, they did not have any mathematical objects that could understand or, or the shape of a tree. Right? And so it's, it's not a straight line. It's not a, it's not a sphere. It's not a triangle. It's not a cone. Um, I think it was, I was watching a documentary recently and, and uh, McCulloch, one of the guys who really got started with the theoretical neuroscience, he said, I spent 20 years counting a pine cone. And he was trying to figure out, you know, what actually is, you know, the relationship between like the windings and the, and, the, and the spirals and all that. And there's the Fibonacci sequence in there and all kinds of, of really great stuff. So, you know, the, going back to this idea that physics is dead and we figured everything out. No, we haven't. Right. We don't even know how the seeds are placed on a strawberry yet. And so here's some simple models of that that we can put together. Very similar types of models. This one's really fascinating. This is like sort of a lettuce model. It's why is lettuce is crimpled on the outside. So here's a sort of a two dimensional cellular automata but it lives on sort of this circular world. And what happens is when things grow, they only grow on the outside. The outside layer is growing, but the inside layer isn't any bigger than it was. And so now you have a problem because you have to connect a longer piece of string with a shorter piece of string. And the only way to do that is for the, if the outer edge sort of ripples out into a third dimension. And so this ripple that you see in sort of, uh, you know, certain lettuces and stuff, it's because the outside was growing so fast, it could not keep up with the inner edge of the leaf, right? Just like the mollusk, but it's going so fast. It has to sort of break out into this third dimension and go up and down. You can try this yourself with a piece of plastic. Let me see. Probably do it with this. Can you guys see me on the podium? Let's see, this might not work. Let me see. No, a little bit. If you kind of get a piece of plastic, like a plastic bag later, these things are going to happen. 
not quite gonna go. But what you'll see later is if you get it with a plastic bag and kind of rip it down the middle, you'll get the point where it does just this. You'll stretch the plastic, but only on the outer pieces, and then you'll get that curl effect. So go get like a plastic grocery bag later and rip it down the middle, and you'll see this cool waffle edge that will, that will form on the outside, and it'll look just like this. You can try that yourself. Okay, so when we build these, these random numbers, you know, these, these neural networks, one of the most powerful things is going to be these random numbers. And we're going we're gonna to look at that a lot. It's, we've looked at random walks. We're going to look at random matrices. And where does randomness come from? Where does nature actually get noise, right? Where does the fuzzy stuff, right? This is the bane of engineers, right? They want to get the noise out of the system and get your measurements out. Where is it, what is this stuff, right? Is it just, you know... Did the angels just sprinkle this noise all over to make, to make the world run? Or, or where does it come from? Um, and this is very closely related to this idea of, of uh, turbulence, you know, and, and, and you know, where does this sort of irregularity, the unpredictability come from in, in these models? So I'm going to come back to that in a second. Um, I like this one. This one is uh, for crystal growth. And so if we just assume a one dimension or two dimensional cellular automata, we can get this crystal. You think, well, that's a really boring crystal. It doesn't look like snowflakes or anything. Uh, but snowflakes have this really interesting property of thermodynamics that, you know, to, um, to melt something, you put heat in, right? You put heat into something and you, and you, and you melt it. So when you freeze something, freezing is the opposite of melting. So when you freeze something, heat comes out, which is kind of funny, right? Think about it. You put heat in to melt something. So when you freeze something, the opposite, you actually heat is coming out. And so when you make a, an ice crystal, every time you get a little piece that freezes, you, it actually gets a little bit warmer and you inhibit that area from freezing another piece. And so this is why ice has the shape it has, because once you've formed a little bit of ice here, you've actually warmed up the air there and in this little pocket and stuff. That's now a little micro pocket of warm air for just a little half of a microsecond. But that will now cause the ice to go on to the next part where it just gets cold enough again, and then it'll freeze there. And that's what these shapes are. And so we can do that with the cellular automata. We can have a rule that says, Grow your crystal, but if you've made three in a row or so, now you've made a little region that inhibits. It's a little too warm there, and you can now inhibit crystal growth, and now we get um, sort of digital artificial snowflakes. So I just love this idea of taking these sort of brutally simple ideas, you know, like children's game board type things, and then we can actually start to get towards real systems in nature. Okay, so here's this rule 30. You know, where does this irregularity come from? Where does the noise or the unpredictability, is it cooked into the universe? Is it cooked into this rule? Is it just generating, right? So, that, you know, where do we get, you know, random numbers? So there's sort of like a few different ways, you know, to think about this. The random just, just comes from the outside, that there's this deus ex machina system that just injects noise into the universe, and we don't know where that comes from. Another could be that it's just in the initial conditions, that somehow we don't know the, the initial state of the world and we unfold it. And so that noise is just carried along. But really, I think one of the most interesting is this third, this third idea of that maybe it's a system like this automata. It starts with an incredibly simple rule. It starts with an incredibly simple state of just one thing turned on. And yet when we run it, it generates what looks like noise. It's, in, it's indistinguishable from true random noise. So is that how the universe is getting its noise by just running these simple little programs and that's generating the noise? We're going to use noise a lot for these machine learning algorithms. We can use these for hypervectors, um, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Okay. Um, this stuff is all over the place, right? These automata are all over the place. I was happy to, I, was, I found this one dimensional automaton in my front yard in North Carolina uh, a few years ago. And I was so excited because I had been studying these things in an abstract sense online. And these are ants that herd aphids. So this is, as far as we know, the only other uh, species that's domesticated than other animal species. And the aphid creates a little bit of a honeydew. It's like a little cow. And it likes to uh, drink the sap of the leaves there. And the ants have a sort of evolutionary deal with the aphids. And they protect and take care and herd and, and, and monitor the, 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 the aphids. And in exchange, the aphids deliver honeydew to the ants. And um, what they've done here is they've, in, 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 their sort of, in their complex systems of genius, They've found a one-dimensional world, right? If we wander around in 2D, we can easily get lost, and your ants and your, your, your cows will leave, right? And so what they've done is they've found a vine. And this picture, it looks like it's got lots of pieces coming off, but actually this is just one long piece. And what's interesting about living on a string is now you only need two ants to do the guarding. You put one ant at one end of the string, and you put another ant at the other end of the string, and now the aphids are in like a little fence. There's only two ways out. 
You've got ants at the post. They're happy to be there. They don't want to leave the ants. The ants will actually pick, when it starts to rain, the ants will pick them up and bring them underneath the leaf and get them out of the water and stuff. You know, they got a good deal. Um, but I just, I, was, I just thought it was so cool how they had found this lower dimensional world to live on. And one thing that's really interesting, and this is actually happens in the ocean. So if you go into the big bulk of the ocean itself, right? Just take like a big chunk out in the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of the water, and a big chunk of stuff. There's not really much stuff in there. There's not really much stuff in there. And that's the reason why is because of these random walks. It would take too long to bump into any of your friends. And so what animals do is they live at the reef. They live at the shelf. They live at the undersea vent. They live at the Gulf Stream. You have to live in a lower dimensional place. They have to live in a 2D or even a 1D environment such that they can actually have some, you know, some chance of, of seeing their friends and then doing all that kind of stuff. Okay, so um, I mentioned Tony Hay earlier. This is his book, Feynman and Computation. This is a fantastic book if you haven't gone through that. Um, Feynman, uh, uh, Information is Physical, Inevitably Physical by uh, Robert Landauer, works at IBM. Um, this is just fun stuff. You don't have to stress about these things. But if you're interested in these directions, please check these out. Uh, si simulating Physics with Computers is a, is a classic by Richard Feynman. It's unbelievable. Uh, Marvin Minsky has a whole thing about Richard Feynman and cellular vacuum. Uh, Danny Hillis, he's the one we mentioned before uh, that he wanted to make a machine that was proud of him. He, he created the connection machine. I put a number of the connection machine videos on there. Uh, Rachel found another one that has connection machine that's really good that's on there. Um, Toffoli, he was one of the big names in this uh, space of computation, namely this idea of reversible computations. So maybe we'll get into that a little bit. And then if you haven't seen it already, check out Wolfram's New Kind of Science. It's free online. Yeah, I'll put it on there now. So if well, you just, yeah, question. This is just a quick comment and, yeah. and maybe a little, a, a bit much, but it's sort of the, the, I guess the program of, um, of physics in some ways, in terms of elemental element, you know, uh, describing things in terms of, uh, the most fundamental elements and then the interactions between those elements, it's ultimately fully locally, uh, you know, based on local interactions, you could make the argument, right. That, um, that, the project of physics itself is in some ways to characterize uh, everything in terms of a, you know, the universe as a cellular automaton. I think that, I don't think that's, that's, you know, outside of the range of conjecture. That's in some ways, that's sort of fundamentally what you're trying to do. Yeah, I, I, exactly. And I think that's really sort of the interesting, you know, there's these two camps. There's this camp of digital physics, which says that it's probably, you know, this cellular automaton type stuff. And then there's this other camp of, um, you know, continuous math. And I, I think it's really interesting. I'm of the opinion, you know, the classical math would suggest that the most important um, units, you know, in physics is all about keeping track of these units. And so we have things like the kilogram and the second and the meter and the in charge and all this kind of stuff. I'm of the opinion that the most important unit is going to be the bit. It's going gonna, it's gonna to end up being information. And what I like about these models is they work directly at the information level, right? So physics works at this abstraction, you know, with mass and inertia and, and you know, matter and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I, I think this is good. I think we need to build, we need to build a bridge between those. And I think that's what quantum computing is, is basically trying to do. I mean, if we really look at, you know, there's two kinds of branches of quantum computing, people that are trying to speed up, you know, cracking passwords, but there's other people that are just really trying to, you know, build these machines to understand, uh, understand physics. You know, it's been said that one of the means, it'd be, it'd be super interesting if we can't build quantum computers, because then they would say so we're missing something about, about physics. Um, but yeah, I think it's this idea of, you know, is the world a big computer, I think is a weird question. It might not even make any sense. Does the world run programs? You know, um, this idea of like the code, but then you have to have this system that runs in it. I think often with biology and DNA and proteins and all that, you know, we call that the code of life, but we, we also have to remember it runs on something. So what is it running on, right? So when we have like this pattern, like that wire world pattern, that's sort of like the DNA, and then it, it's executed on this digital physics of the cellular time at the background. We are made up of uh, electrons and proteins and everything else. You know, what is the substrate that that's running on? Sort of, are there simple rules? You know, Feynman described it as a chessboard, which, you know, very simple kind of rules. Is that what it's like? Is it just going to be, you know, keep going all the way down? You know, Feynman said maybe it's like an onion and there's just layers and layers and layers and we'll never, we'll never get to the bottom. Uh, I'm, I'm in the opinion that, you know, Feynman said something. He said, he said in the, in the end, the machinery will be revealed, he felt. And I'm kind of on that opinion. I think that we are going to figure out a lot more than we know now. And I think we're going to need these different kinds of models. And maybe we do need this different kind of science, right? 
So definitely check this out. This book is like 1300 pages. It's, it's, it's extraordinary, um, but just kind of flip through it. It's got really great stuff. Any other questions on that? So let's, let's run one of these. Um, I promised you we would do that. Okay. So let's, let's pull up a notebook. So I, let me share this onto the, um, the GitHub real quick. Cause I don't think it is. Looks like Misha's got a copy. Let's see, copy the link, change to anyone with the link, copy the link, done. Okay, so I'll put this uh, right on the list of notebooks and so you could pull this up. I'll put it at the end here. Let's call this Wolfram, Automata. While we're on the topic of Automa Automata, if you haven't seen the classical Automata, uh, there's some really famous automata from the 1700s that are just extraordinary. Uh, so remind me, we'll, we'll, we'll bring that up next time. Okay, so I'm gonna we're gonna try to do one of these um, Wolfram Wolfram style one dimensional automata. So let me know if everybody, hopefully everybody can see this. Um, we're gonna create a world. We're gonna make it. Go ahead. Is there a question? I think it was just feedback. Okay, maybe somebody can hit mute because we seem to be getting some typing noises and such. Okay, so I'm gonna make this. I'm going to make this 100 by 100 because we want to look at time going down. So I'll make the, I'll just make this a, a big square. It's going to be empty. So I'm going to make it zeros to start. I'm going to use this plot function to show it to us. And when we plot it out, it's just a big empty square, nothing there to see. So then what we can do is that's the, that's this array C. I want to turn one pixel on. So I'm going to go to the row zero. I'm going to go to the 50th column and I'm going to set it equal to a one. And then I'm going to replot that image. And we can see that now we have sort of one pixel turned on. So we're kind of simulating the Wolfram, Wolfram style one row. And now what we're going to do is we're going to march down and we're going to calculate each row based on what its previous neighbors were. So I'm going to show you this wacky thing. Don't try to code, don't try to parse this right now. It'll be sure to your challenge to figure out, reverse engineer that later. If that's stressful, don't stress about it. We'll do it a couple of different ways. But this is just a fun way to go through and it's going to convert, it's going to use the binary kind of number system to convert the rule directly and then figure out the rules. And so we'll run that. I'll leave that as a, as a challenge to figure out how that one works. If that stresses you out, don't stress by it. Um, and so we can run that and we can see here's rule 30. I'll challenge you to write this in a more traditional format as well. So you can set up your rule table. We'll have that down here in just a second. Okay, so that's the rule 30. It sort of makes this, I call it rain on the window kind of effect sort of this naturalistic looking pattern. Now there's another one really interesting. It's called rule 110. And we're gonna talk a lot about Turing machines, but just to kind of give you a preview, uh, we're gonna look at this particular pattern. It's just like the others. We can start it out random instead of starting it out with one thought. We can just start the first row is just something. And then we can run and see what the evolution of that would look like. And so we can kind of see that pattern. It looks kind of regular. But what's really fascinating, and we're gonna sort of talk about the theory of this, is this, this particular rule, there's a theory that says that you could code any other problem that you want to solve as a particular pattern. So you imagine, you know, what's something you want to solve? Uh, pick, some, pick, a, pick a computer problem you'd want to solve. Anything. I think a computer identifying problem. dogs versus cats. Okay, so you want to identify a dog versus a cat. So theoretically, what this is saying is that there is a certain pattern that you can put in here. The first part might represent the dog, the photograph itself, and then some other pattern that represents the, the equation you're trying to run. This, the sort, let me know if this is a cat or dog. And this pattern might be like a million miles long. But in theory, there is a pattern that we can put into this row, run this one simple rule over and over and over again. And when it's done, we'll have one little spot. You know, if it's a cat, it'll be left with one little spot. If it's a dog, there'll be nothing left. Now, it's not going to be practical for us to, to engineer that system, but it's shown in theory that we can actually do that. So that's this idea of universality, and it's a really strange concept because we traditionally think that there's, 
there's better computers. I have a, I have a certain kind of computer, and if only I had a, a better computer, right? And there's a funny thing that comp all computers are the same in some sense, except for how fast they run. And so there's this thing about, are you going to consider how long it takes, or are you just going to consider that it can do it? And so the classical mathematical theory, the classical computing theory, just talked about whether or not it can do it at all. And if you can do it at all, then any computer can do anything any other computer can do, which is kind of strange, because any computer can just simulate some other computer. And it might take a long time to do it, but it can, it can do it. So if time doesn't matter, any computer can do anything. But I think time does matter. And so that's this idea of complexity that we're going we're gonna to get to, computational complexity. So I think I had another version of this. Yeah. So I have another version of this. Um, there's a Wolfram. Let me put this one also on the, on the GitHub real quick. Let me share this one. Change the link, link. Copy the link. Back to GitHub. I'm going to put a second Wolfram notebook here. Call this Wolfram Automata 2. Okay, update that. Okay, so now you can now you can pull up the second notebook, and that one's going to look like this. This one has a, the, a nice Wolfram talk. Um, it's a little boring. I would definitely recommend this one, watching this one on 2, 2x, but it's fascinating. It's a lot of the material we just covered, so I kind of recap this one just now. Um, so, but if you but if you but if you like these ideas, please go through and watch it. It's a, it's a really great talk. Um, he's definitely ahead of his time. I wish more people took him seriously. His ego is definitely in the way. Okay, so now we're going to do this a few different ways, right? Uh, I like I like lots of different ways to do things. Uh, Minsky said, if you you only, you don't understand something if you only know it one way. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing again. Let's do it that way. Here's our rule 90. So what we can do is we can set up this rule like this. And so the other way was just kind of for fun, that if you're into the, into, you know, the other kind of more mathematical coding, please look at the other version. But this one's a little more straightforward. And so this one's going to say what the rule is. And so we're going to set up the rule for given what you are and what your two neighbors are, what you're going to turn into. And so now this is a little lookup table. For any spot we want to consider what it's going to be next, we look at what it is now, what its two neighbors are, and then that will give us the next value. And so that's our little rule table. And if we take our, our cellular automata, we're going to loop through all of the rows, and then we're going to loop through all of the columns. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at what's directly north. I'm calling the neighbor that you were. I'm calling that north. And then we have a northwest and a northeast. And so these are just sort of, you know, if you're looking at this one, this would be your north, this would be your northwest, and this would be your northeast. Right? So like these here. So this would be the north, northwest, northeast. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we want to find out uh, what, what to do with that. So first we figure out, well, what are the values in those three spots? Then I go to my rule, and I say, well, that's the value that's in that spot, that spot, and that spot. And the rule is this little table. And that's going to replace the value in the current spot. So we have a rule table up here. We're going to loop through all of the rows and columns. We're going to figure out what, what you were, what your two neighbors were. You're going to plug that into the rule table, and that will give you the output of what value you're going to be on that thing. And then we're going to run that whole thing. And if we do that, we get our nice Sierpinski gasket there, a nice pattern. It's interesting. I, I, I kind of glazed over in that slides. I had some, um, let's see, you know, these, excuse me, these kind of interesting patterns that humans have created, right? So it just glossed over those. You know, how did people make these? And how did people, where did they come up with the ideas? Were they executing these simple rules? Maybe people just had sort of like the game. Here's the game you play. You put down a blue tile, and then you look at the tile above it, and then you figure out if the two, and then based on that, you look at the little rule book, and that'll tell you how to build this thing out. So that's certainly one way they maybe have built out those sort of uh, patterns. Okay, let me go back to this. Okay, now this is the, the direct formula method. So um, if you're so inclined, please try to take apart that rule. And so that's three different methods to do this. I, I skipped over the first one here, which is the, um, the spreadsheet. And so just for fun, maybe you've had some experience with spreadsheets or you just want to look at this. Um, and so this is a way of actually doing this with a spreadsheet. Let me zoom in here a bit. And so if you're familiar with, if you're not familiar with spreadsheets, you don't like spreadsheets, don't worry about this. But if you like spreadsheets and you want to figure this out, what you can do is you can click on each square and then you can figure out the formula and you can see it's looking at the blue square, it's looking at that square, it's looking at that square, and then it's using this, uh, this formula that you can try to reverse engineer. 
And so that's just kind of a, a fun way of doing it in terms of you know referencing in, in Excel. All right, any questions about this, um, the Wolfram, the Wolfram automata, this sort of one dimensional automata? Okay, so we've got just a few minutes left for today. So maybe what we can do is we can go back to these, um, close the wrong one, let me pull back up the GitHub. Last time we were going through this notebook of, it says convolution and PDE. And this is where we had our cellular automata. So let's just kind of uh, run back in that one and then just kind of give you a preview of some of these uh, continuous patterns that we're gonna create. So we can kind of extend this cellular automata paradigm Oh, I clicked the wrong link. I don't want to look at the notebook there. Sorry, that's the, uh, that's the notebook, like the, the saved version of the notebook. I want the link. So I'm going to scroll down and bring me to the live collab. So let's see, convolution and PDE. So we'll pull that one up. So what I'm trying to do essentially is to have you guys recreate the sort of experience that I went through that, I could, that, that brought me to where I am to figure out this material. And so I early on studied cellular automata, and then I looked at some of these other equations, and that sort of helped me kind of figure out and make sense of all this, 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 modern, this modern space. So that's kind of the idea of this, of this tour, so to speak. Okay, so uh, this notebook we were looking at last time, we'll just kind of jump in here a bit. Again, please review these uh, in the evenings and on the weekends. You're going to have to go through and, and write these, you know, rename these yourself, give them different variable names load in different pictures, make it something fun, load in your cat or dog, you know, make it relevant to something you care about so that you can do this. You, you really have to, uh, you know, practice these codes. You, if you just listen to me, you'll have a fun, you'll have a fun tour, but you won't have any skills to build this stuff, right? The part of your brain that listens is not the same part of your brain that has to hack, hack through these codes. And it, it takes a lot of practice. I work on these codes every day. Um, so let's just jump down to the end here. There's a lot in this notebook. We did some, some basic convolutions. We did, um, we did some cellular automata with those convolutions. So we used the convolution as, a, as an operator to sort of count our neighbors, which was really cool. Uh, we used convolution here to, as like a filter to say where we can find things. And so this convolution operator, it's like a Swiss army knife, right? It can look for patterns, it can count neighbors. We can slice in julienne fries. Probably not, well, maybe. A neural, a neural network controlled by a convolutional neural network. Okay, so go through. Um, you can try to rewrite these codes yourself. Try to figure out this sort of style where I'm trying to trying to force you to think in parallel. To try to think you of you know a thousand numbers at once. That that's really kind of the, the heart of machine learning is you kind of have to juggle, and not not actively juggle, but just know that you're working with like sort of a photograph. We don't we're not scared by photographs, and photographs are millions of numbers at once. And so we have to kind of just learn to work with these larger objects that parts of our brain are good at. But I want to just kind of preview. I think we looked a little bit last time, these continuous ones in, in Ready. So if, if you haven't, also make sure that you go through the Ready program and look at these. But I wanted to show how we're going to use this, this, this convolution one more time to do these continuous things. So in our slides, we were looking at the animal patterns. And there's kind of two ways to think about these. They either live on a graph paper or they live in sort of a chemical world that's continuous. And this one we're going to sort of as like a semi-continuous world. We're still going to run it on the computer in little squares. I mean, that's all we ever get with the computer. So you can imagine that I'm partial towards the digital physics because I'm partial to computers, and that's what we can run on a computer. If we want to do the other math, we need an analog computer. Okay, so uh, we're going to go through this again next time. I just wanted to kind of give you a preview of how we're going to use this very special filter here. This is called the Laplacian. And you can see it's just a convolution filter. It has a negative number in the middle ones on the on the north south east and west and sort of a half on the side so it's just it's just a filter it's a pattern and when we run this pattern uh what we're going to do is we're going to be able to get some really interesting dynamics out of these systems and so that's how it's going to start up we're going to run this i think the animation's already saved here so we can just kind of watch this let's see yeah let me download this one see video as And so I just think this is really, really fascinating and really fun because traditionally this was like kind of stuff, it's like almost too hard to get to. I don't know how to explain it. Um, 
that if you actually wanted to make this picture, the code that would do it or whatever it would be kind of extraordinary. And so I've tried to make this as simple as possible to really that there's the same mechanisms that we can use over and over again, and they can ex explain like a whole wide variety of like natural phenomenon, everything from a forest fire overhead to the the cellular dynamics on on the patterns to you know all this kind of crazy crazy wacky stuff that seems so different and it shows up all in different areas of physics or different areas of science itself and i think it's because it's this it's this sort of information it's, it's sort of something like natural computation that that biological systems are doing something analogous to computation as we think of it to solve the problems they need to solve just to to exist so run this run this uh, tonight if you haven't we're going to keep looking at this next time um, but if you want to get a head start, go and run these patterns. What you can do is you uncomment one of these at a time, and that will determine sort of the recipe. So again, what's really exciting is we have this lower dimensional space. We have four numbers, right? So it's easier for DNA or something or an evolutionary system to sort of get a control on four things. And from just changing these four numbers, right, from 0.16 to 0.14, right, and changing everything else the same, we're going to get like a big difference in the behavior. And so this one, when we run it, let's save this one. We had briefly, we had looked at this one briefly in the ready program, but I think it's really fun to kind of see and you get to code these yourself. You know, if, if I didn't know how this worked, I would think there's some kind of, you know, higher level program that's keeping track and saying make bacteria one. And now it's been 10 seconds, split bacteria one into bacteria two and three. But there is no control like that. This is just like cellular automata. Everything is happening in an extraordinarily local sense. There's no communication across the global there's no, there's no global pattern that was like, cooked into this thing. Uh, it's sort of, this is what emerges when you have, you know, those kind of rules. So, yeah. Sorry, what are like the uh, so in general, this is a reaction diffusion equation. So this is just like, this is a type of partial differential equation and um, the reaction diffusion would be what you would, what you would look up. Yeah. Um, there's a really cool branch called Rea reaction diffusion mechanical system, which would be like for muscles and all that kind of stuff. So I think this is a really great uh, area of physics and, and, and sort of biology. Let's look at this one. So to so run these things yourself, change the parameters and see, you know, where does that pattern come from, right? Like, where is the information? Where's the recipe coming from, right? It seems like it's too simple a rule because if we go back and we look at these things, it's like, is that is that in those numbers? Is it in there? You know, and so that's kind of that's kind of strange of like, you know, where does this complexity, where do these patterns actually come from? I think maybe is this is this the same one or is this a slightly different one? This might be slightly different. Let's see. It looks a little different. Yeah, so it's like, you know, where is that recipe? Is all that information in there? Kind of looks like a biological circuit, kind of looks like this, this brain folding. You know, where does it come, where does it come from? I think we've we've put too much of the burden on DNA in a sense, right? We think everything has to be coded in the DNA. Well, sort of. Here the, the world is doing a lot of work to actually determine what that thing is gonna be. And it was only it only needed four numbers. All right, so we're out of time for today. If there's any questions, uh, please let me know. If not, you can send them later. Um, you know, please go through and, and, and run these things yourself. You know, take some time and actually actually explore these things. Let us know if you can find some new patterns. Let us know if you can find some new areas that you could think of applying these to. All right, any thoughts or questions, comments for today? Well, I thank you all for your, your time and attention and we'll see you next session. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, everybody. That was really cool. Sorry, I just wanted to say I did blink in the chat with what was the correct thing. If there is no proof that the one column is computationally intractable, but there was a